Schools across Wisconsin will be opening in, in a few days, so it's a great time for a special edition of Civil Dialogue, the Back to School edition. And I want to thank our key four key legislators who are uh, involved in how we fund public schools and some of these major issues for joining us today. I want to thank uh, to my left Republican Representative Jeremy Thiesfeld from uh, Fond du Lac, represents District 52. He's chairman of the Assembly Education Committee. Sandy Pope is a Democratic representative from Mount Horeb. She represents District 80. She's a former chair of the Assembly Education Committee. Senator Luther Olson of Ripon represents Senate District 14. He's chair of the Senate Education Committee and a member of the Joint Committee on Finance. Democratic Senator Chris Larson of Milwaukee represents District 7. Thanks very much for joining us. Very timely subject. Here, Let me, uh, some context. State government will collect 17.4 million in general fund taxes in this fiscal year, according to the Fiscal Bureau. For the first time, six billion of that will go to K-12 schools in categorical and general aids. Um, that's 34% of all state general fund taxes going to K-12. The budgets that you've voted on, for and against, recently put 200 per pupil for four straight years. So that's kind of the setup. I wanna ask each of you when Wisconsin parents drop off their kids at schools or put them on buses in the next few days, how healthy, how well off, this, what is the state of Wisconsin's K-12 schools? Representative. Well, I think our schools are strong. Uh, we have lots of variety available for families. Uh, I think that's a positive thing. Test scores have been moving up. Uh, we'd like that to accelerate uh, beyond what it has. Uh, because we've seen stronger growth in other states, but largely those other states started at a lower position than what Wisconsin did. And so it's tougher for us to move up that scale uh, than others might. Uh, but I, I think we're headed in the right direction. Uh, clearly, uh, with all of the spending that was mentioned, uh, the people of Wisconsin polling certainly indicates that they take education very seriously and they want our tax dollars to be expended in education. Thank you, Representative. I would agree our schools are in, in, in pretty good shape. There's always room for improvement. Um, and I'm specifically talking about our public schools because I don't know how to evaluate what's going on in the private and voucher sectors. Um, and I know that we have a lot of students going there. But um, I, think, I think there's room for improvement. Uh, we, we need to begin addressing graduation rates in some of our larger schools, our urban areas. And um, we have a lot of work to do with the bilingual, bicultural uh, areas. So yes, there's room for improvement, but overall your kids are going to be safe. They're going to be in the hands of well-prepared teachers and staff. And I, I think things look pretty good. Thank you. Senator. Yeah, I would have to agree with my colleagues. Um, Wisconsin schools are in good shape. Uh, we have dedicated quality teachers in our state. I have had the opportunity to attend, I think now, three or four education related things around the country. And it's always amazing to hear what other states are struggling with where we've already dealt with those issues, you know, uh, full day kindergarten, things like that. There are states that don't even have that yet. Do we have issues? Of course we have issues. Um, you know, just like every other state, we have a shortage of teachers. Uh, other states have that. We have increased um, mental health issues, all these challenges. And as you heard, we have a achievement gap that we need to, to narrow because we need that workforce in the state of Wisconsin. Senator, do you represent the uh, state's largest school district? Sir. Yeah, my kids are going to be going there um, starting in two weeks, too. So, yeah, the, uh, I think it's good, but it's also compared to where it could be. It, it could be great, and we're not quite there. I think that the uh, attacks that happened on teachers have definitely, you know, still impacted morale. I think the teachers and principals and school workers are continuing to try and work miracles. The graduation rate ticked up a point for MPS. Uh, which is fantastic, but we had a scare. Uh, we had a letter that went out to me and all the other parents uh, across all the schools saying, we're gonna have to cut staff because the budget's not there. They were able to realign their budget and make it work, so we didn't have to see those staff reductions, so they're gonna make do with what they've got, but uh, compared with where we could be, compared with if we were funding uh, what is needed and not just enough to try and coast, um, I think we could, could have been a lot better off. We, we are eight years past the Act 10 legacy. Um, 
have those changes worked its way through the system? Uh, are, are, are we still dealing with some of these issues? Any, any thoughts on that, any of you? I would say clearly we're still working through some of those issues. With the Blue Ribbon Commission traveling all over the state of Wisconsin, yeah. everywhere we went, we heard about teacher recruitment and retention issues and morale problems, how teachers are reluctant to become, stu well, how students are reluctant to become teachers because of, you know, the perceived uh, educator problem. Let's just call it that. Although I've been, you know, here I chaired the Education Committee in the Assembly and, and now the Senate off and on, and I've heard morale issues for 25 years. You know, it seems like it's always one of those things that we, we talk about way before Act 10 ever came and depend, it doesn't make any difference who the, the governor is. But I, I think um, I think school districts are able to make good decisions now with the staff and the teachers in a lot of districts where they're not opposing each other. The goal is that they work together to improve education and, and that has happened in a lot, a lot of districts. I'm sorry, I just have to say it does make a big difference who the governor is. Act 10 was a huge setback for teacher morale and that came from a specific governor. Equal time, sir. Yeah, I, you know, their teacher morale was mentioned a couple times. Uh, I've been on faculties uh, over 20 years worth, and albeit those were private school faculties, I can tell you that morale on staff, uh, if there is bad morale, it isn't necessarily just coming in public schools. There are private schools that have bad morale, and there are a wide array of things as to why it could be, but I would say that the strongest one oftentimes is the lack of proper leadership within the school. Um, it isn't necessarily about benefits or pay. Uh, people who are in, in teaching are there largely because they have a passion for it, uh, helping children. Uh, they just love to be in front of kids and uh, seeing what comes of those children in the years after they graduate and move on into the private sector or into the public sector, whatever job it is that they decide to do. Uh, it, and I think that's somewhat different than a lot of other occupations out there. Uh, it's clearly an important thing to have good teacher morale and I, I think that some of that has dissipated as time has gone by as all things do you know time heals wounds but the mo the actions that were taken were necessary at the time and I think the state has benefited from it. Yeah. Senator Larson you, you talked about MPS for your graduation rates ticking up one percent yep. from from what to what? I mean, is it still under 70 percent, sir? Yeah, it's still low. We still need to, I mean, look, MPS, uh, we're grappling with the largest urban district in the state, so we're grappling with poverty. There's a report that finally came out. We were able to get the numbers on how much students move and the number of students who are, uh, they're dealing with things like homelessness, they're dealing with things like hunger, they're dealing with single parent families. Um, and so you end up having on average half of those students are finishing in a different school at the end of the year half, from where they started. Half, half based off of, of this, MPS this study in from a different school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From in, in May from where they started in September. Right. And that's on average. So you have some students who are bouncing from school to school. Now, trying to be able to get accurate numbers, trying to be able to make sure that that child is getting a quality education when they're probably, their biggest priority is making sure they have a place to sleep that night, trying to make sure that they're going to have a meal once they leave the classroom. Those are some of the problems that we deal with in a large urban school district. And look, when we have seen, based off of where we are and where we could be, there's three and a half billion dollars that could have gone to our schools had we kept pace with the last budget before Scott Walker uh, became governor and put forward historic cuts and at the same time made teachers absorb that. Um, and I think as a result, look, we're working, yes, people are passionate about education. The people who are in it are not in it to become rich. They're in it because they care about kids. But kicking their seat away from the negotiating table and preventing them from even, even having a say, uh, I think it, it has an impact and that's going to have a reverberating impact. They're advocates for, uh, for education. They're advocates for those kids and not having them at the table. Uh, it, it's had an impact and that's going to be a, a lasting scar in our state. The, the governor's budget that he recommended in February, the original budget, included different funding formulas for poverty, 
English language, uh, English as a second language. The goal was to close the achievement gap, which unfortunately is very high in Wisconsin. Uh, Republicans, why was that not a part of the budget that, that you gentlemen voted for? Well, it isn't a, that it isn't important. Uh, it's that there are only so many dollars that can be spent. Uh, the proposal the governor put out there, uh, he tried to find as much money as he possibly could for education and then some. Uh, and these are, that's what uh, his side of the aisle uh, was demanding. That's what the people who voted for him wanted to have happen. Uh, and so it's only logical that he was going to push for that. Um, but we, we have political balance here in the legislature. Um, Republicans were see, hearing something different from their constituents. Uh, and we want to make sure that we are handling things uh, in a fiscally responsible manner. Uh, it is certainly possible at some point in time there will be significant dollars put towards the, the things that you mentioned, uh, but this was not the right time to get that accomplished. Any PS on that, Senator? Well, um, a lot of those things are things that came out of the Blue Ribbon Task Force, yes. and I, I would have wanted them to be in the budget, but our decision was to not put or put very, very little non-fiscal policy in the budget. Now, it was it was dealing with money, but it was non-fiscal. I mean, it was saying, okay, instead of uh, counting a child as one, we'll count them as 1.2. Mm -hmm. So our goal is to be able to introduce those things as standalone bills here uh, this fall and, and winter uh, so that we can do those. But I think there's good research saying that we need to do this, but it really was a decision that we're not putting any non-fiscal policy in there, and I, we did, but not much, just because of the veto issue and all that. That's really what it amounted to. Okay, let's talk about special ed funding. The governor campaigned on and put in his budget 600 million upper for special ed. Uh, Senator, on joint finance, you said that uh, we're, we're gonna come close with 100 million upper and the governor ought to be satisfied for that. Can you put that comment in context? Well, we had not increased special ed funding for 10 years. 10 years. And the cost of special ed had increased, um, but those students were getting their services. It was just taking money from regular ed to s supplement the shortfall in special ed. So what we did is we, at the second year of this budget, it's going to be at 30%, which is the number that the governor put when he was state superintendent put in his budget to get to 30 percent. So I am very happy because it's not it's never going to go down. It's always it has to stay at 30 percent and it's a percent. So at the end of the day those numbers will increase budget after budget even if the percent doesn't. But the goal hopefully will be that that percent will increase along with the numbers because we have some very expensive boys and girls that we need to take care of in our public schools and it costs money but it shouldn't come on the backs of the regular ed kids, which it, it has. And so this is a step in the right direction. Sure, it wasn't 600 million, but it was about 100 million, which is way more than we've done for a long time. And when I talked to uh, superintendents and talked to them about 30%, they said, if you get us 30%, we, will, we know it's realistic and we will be happy. Would we like more? Of course, but give us the 30% and we can run with that. And this, is, and this is something where our, my school districts, my teachers, the folks that I talk to, um, look, this is something that's, that they're in need of because it draws money away from other students. And if the state is not fulfilling its pledge, uh, we, we are paying the 60%, which frankly was done back under Tommy Thompson. If we're not doing that, those funds have to come from somewhere else. The last numbers we have on this is a billion dollars being spent statewide where they're having to make up for this at the local level for special education. And I, I think of the quote, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. And if we are not putting the money forward from the state, those schools are having to pull it from somewhere else. Those other students are not getting the attention. They're not getting the resources that they need. And that reverberates through, right? If we are not tackling this for students with disabilities, students who need special attention in schools, we are making it that much harder for them to succeed uh, throughout life. And so that is something that Evers campaigned on. That is something that was out there. It was something that uh, was in the Blue Ribbon Commission. And frankly, 
we're at a point where we're at a surplus. We have a surplus. So if the, we were going to spend the money, this is the time when we have it. We should have done that. It was a missed opportunity. I'm sorry, Senator. Yeah. Representatives, wasn't going to 100 million a significant increase that will make a difference? I wouldn't call that significant by would any stretch. By no. any stretch? No. And that's partly because of what we learned from the Blue Ribbon Commission traveling all over the state of Wisconsin. Everywhere we went, we heard about how the special ed uh, expenses were really um, making education so difficult. I don't know what superintendents you've been talking to, Luther, but my superintendents, the ones that I have been hearing from, are not satisfied with 100 million. It's just, it doesn't begin to do a dent in what we've been living with for the last 10 years. Mr. Chairman? Uh, the superintendents I've spoken with also we're very satisfied with that amount. Um, whether it's an adequate amount, that's a whole nother question, but it certainly was a significant increase considering especially hadn't been increased in 10 years. And I think it was appropriate to do that. And there will be more increases in years to come. Once again, it has to come at a pace that is fiscally responsible. Uh, and I, I think that the Joint Finance Committee, when they put together their plan, they accomplished that and the governor did sign it into law. Uh, but I think a larger question with special education is uh, ought to be why do we have continually higher amounts of special education students? Um, that, that's something we need to dig deeper into. Uh, as percentage of students, I think that's a number that continues to rise. Uh, and as we continue to have fewer and fewer students statewide, which is another issue behind the scenes here, yes. uh, is declining enrollment statewide. Uh, that's going to become even a more significant part of the overall school budget in the state. When I look up the Legislative Fiscal Bureau info papers, it says that our, our K-12 system is basically funded 48% with state GPR, that's the $6 billion, and 42% with property taxes, and the other 10% is federal aid and miscellaneous. Are Wisconsin's K-12 schools too dependent on property taxes? Is that sustainable? Any, any one of you? Well, I would venture that it, it is, and we keep pushing um, more of our expenses onto property taxpayers. Uh, revenue limits are not helping. Um, it's, exas you know, it's making the problem much, much worse. And we have an obligation to fund education as a state. We can't just keep pushing it off to the property taxpayer. I, I guess the thing about it, there has to be a balance. And research shows that if a state funds all local education through the state budget, the education suffers because the local people don't really have as much skin in the game. Right. So the question is, how much is the appropriate amount? And we have, as much as people have trouble understanding our, our formula, we have districts that get 85, 86% state aid, and we have some that are, in, like in one in my district, get pretty much zero because they have such property wealth. And so the question you have to figure out is how much is the right amount? To me, the property tax is the most sus sustainable tax because property stays there. Sales tax, income tax goes up and down, and so you really never know what's, what's going to happen, and we found that out during the recession. But the real number, and, and Sandy's right, is the revenue limit number. It's how much do you get to spend? Where the money comes from, to me, is sort of important, but how much you get to spend. And it's interesting because every state that I, that I deal with has revenue limits on them. It's just sort of the way it is nowadays. Um, and so we have to make sure that those numbers are increasing so that schools don't fall behind. And one of the biggest costs is labor and insurance. And insurance is really, you know, we had it under control a little bit, but you can only do that once. And then unless you continue to cut benefits, is the, the cost keeps going up. Senator Larson, when we talk about property taxes, MPS is talking about the first referendum in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, do, you think, uh, uh, do you think an MPS referendum will pass? And do, well, and then we've seen more than two billion in referendums passed in the last few years. 
Do you look for that trend to continue for the rest of the panel? But Senator Larson, your perspective on MPS's yeah, potential I mean, look, referendum? I, I think if you look at the other districts that have pushed for referendums because the state has not fulfilled its duty, has not followed through with funding, uh, the, the rate of passage for referendums has gone way up, yes, right? It has. They are, the people understand the need for education, they understand the dialogue that's happening at the Capitol, that the investment isn't there, and they're having to step up and say, look, this is something that's worth uh, putting our dollars for. So for MPS, um, from what I've heard, if they are going to make the case publicly that they have been um, talking about at school board meetings of saying, look, here's where the money is going to go, um, I, think it, I think it will pass. I think people will understand that, look, we need to invest in, uh, in, in, uh, in all of our kids. So, yeah, I think it will move forward. I think, you know, but, but to, to go off of what uh, Representative um, uh, Pope said, the, the issue is we do not have a diversity of where revenues are coming from. For we're, we're putting everything on property tax. Wisconsin is unique in that where uh, they don't have the ability to be able to generate revenues in any other form. Um, and so we need to figure out that, that diversity. But again, that, that puts the onus on the locals. The state should be coming in and making sure that all school districts, all students, have at least a bare minimum level of funding. If MPS holds a referendum with two, two kids in the system, you'll be voting yes? Yeah, you absolutely. Will. Yeah. Now, uh, do you look for the trend of the number of referendums that are being held and Senator's right, the, the passage rate high? Do you look for the even more referendums, or are we going to see that because of, less to, uh, because of more state aid in the last two budgets? You're probably going to see less because of the restrictions on actually holding a referendum. Uh, we've now determined when you may or may not have them. Um, if one fails, you have to wait X number of years before you can bring it forward again. So um, the Republicans have been making it harder and harder to pass referendum, and then at the same time failing to fund adequately education, um, you know, the, the public's hands are being tied in terms of how to respond. Equal time. Uh, I don't, I mean, unlike a lot of my colleagues, I don't really have a problem with the referendums. Um, I, I think that when the state, for whatever reason, has to tighten its belt, it's only a natural reaction that your community uh, school district is going to look to try to recover those costs in a different place. And that's up to the community if they want to want to tax themselves more. Uh, I, I'm okay with some of the restrictions on them because there, there have been some abuses in the system where the frequency of them uh, is troublesome uh, and also the advertising that goes on with them. You know, so that they're, I think they're it's like anything, we should look to have improvements in the system, but if communities want to tax themselves more, I, I don't really have a problem with that. Some of you are members, uh, members of the um, task force on rural schools. Generally, painting broad brush, are rural schools much better off than they were four years ago? I, I don't know that I'd say much better. I, no? I think that there's been progress there. Uh, and I'm not sure if you mean in terms of academically or, or uh, financially. Uh, financially, you know, financially. There, there continues to be struggles because we have declining enrollment and that's going to hit your rural schools harder. Uh, the, the millennials who are starting to have children and millennials in general don't want to live in rural areas. They, they prefer the bigger cities and so you've had movement away from the northern part of the state to the southern part of the state. Uh, those schools are already very distant from each other. Uh, and you can't necessarily combine those schools. And so economy of scale makes it more difficult to fund those schools. Uh, and as they have fewer and fewer students, that challenge increases. Any PSs on rural schools before I go to the next well, topic? Well, I, I think Senator? it all depends on the rural school. I mean, some communities are doing well. Some are, are you know, having declining enrollment and issues like that, which really hits them hard. So you can't just say, are they better off than they were four years ago? Some are worse because they've lost a lot of kids. They just aren't in their, in their enrollment. And some districts have stayed the same or grown some, but it, it all depends on what kind of economic growth they have in their communities that really drive that, I think. And it has a lot more to do with um, other factors than just declining enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, everywhere we went with Blue Ribbon Commission, we heard a great deal about retention and recruitment of 
staff for rural schools, as well as mental health issues that they're facing, and certainly poverty. I mean, we had school districts who on Friday send 18 pounds of food home in a backpack with families because their kids are hungry. Um, you know, there are issues that have certainly gotten worse over the last 10 years. I want to talk about choice. Um, when I ask a physical bureau for a summary, 340 million is budgeted in this current budget for choice. That's 107 million for Racine and Milwaukee. I'm sorry, 107 million for Racine and statewide. 233 million in Milwaukee. It's anticipated 41,000 students will be in choice schools during the school year. Milwaukee, 28.5, 28,500. Racine, 3,700. Statewide, 9,400. There was no major expansion of choice in this budget. Should choice be expanded further? Do choice students do better? Because uh, the studies that I've seen all over, uh, choice started in Milwaukee. Senator. Yeah. I mean, look, I think that this is an experiment that has run its course. I think uh, based off the arguments that were made when it was introduced, it has largely failed. And if it is going to continue, I think it should be up to the locals. We talked about referendums. We talked about local control. If people want voucher schools, if they want to be able to take a chunk of their change and give it to private schools to educate a portion of the population, it should be up to them. It shouldn't be up to us in Madison. Just about every expansion, if not all expansion, if not the creation of this, all happened without public hearing. They happened late in the budget, it was put in, and then it was expanded on. And so I think as we've gone through this, the, the, the arguments that were made, this is the competition is going to help all public schools. Well, that hasn't happened. This is going to be a small population of the school. You have over 80% of these schools getting 100% of their funding from vouchers. That these were somehow the, 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 that they were going to uh, uh, just be a small portion of the population. You, you've said yourself the, the numbers in terms of expansion, and I think the largest argument they're saying now is that it costs slightly less. Well, yes, they are not choosing all of the kids uh, that that want to come to them. They're picking and choosing. So when you have uh, that kind of a captain scenario where you can choose all the students that you want and the rest have to go to public schools. We talked about the increase in special ed. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be cheaper to do it. But other than that, they're, they're not serving the purpose. They haven't proven themselves. And this is not a, a program in its infancy now. This is an adult, right? This is a program that's been around for 30 years. So it's gonna continue. It should be left up to the locals. Uh, the state shouldn't be putting a heavy hand in saying, we're gonna force this on you. Choice is so important, I wanna hear from each of you. Senator. Sure, um, we live in a, day and age now where parents want choices for their kids. I just wrote an op-ed piece that was printed in the Hill and one of the things we said is 50, in 19, or excuse me, 2018, 55% of the public in this country, not Wisconsin, did not, were, were unsatisfied with their public schools. Yep, according Which, to, I'm going to uh, quote go that yeah. op-ed, yeah. according to a 2018 Gallup poll on education, 55% of the public, that's nationally, is dissatisfied with the state of K-12 education. Excuse me, you're talking about choice. Right, and so people want choices, and you, we're not going back on that. Uh, in, one of the reasons that that program has grown is people have used that opportunity. We have a lot of choices in the state of Wisconsin. We have open enrollment, we have virtual charters, we have charter schools, we have all kinds of uh, different school districts uh, alternative schools in a in a school district and we have private school choice and people want those uh, things and it's interesting I was just in Memphis the other day and we were talking about parents now even want in their own school district programs for their own kids individualizing their education because that's where hopefully with technology we can do it it's personalized learning and things like this so this is a movement in this country where people want to have choices for their kids and we have to figure out how we're going to deal with that to make sure that all kids, even the kids who don't take advantage of those choices, get a good quality education. Representative. Any expansion of the voucher program is going to hurt public schools because the money comes from public school funding. And so for me, any expansion is a major expansion. Um, granted, this 
25 year old program, 30 year old program, started as a pilot program, but I don't think we learned anything from it in terms of it's better than what you're doing in public education. And the fact that they aren't required to do many of the things that public schools do, yes, they can teach at a lesser uh, cost, but that doesn't make it better. There's no evidence that they're doing better than public schools and it's costing us from our public school funding. You've been a champion of choice. Your turn. Yeah, it, the, the dollar amount you said before, I forget what it was, 300 340 million, uh, that's money well spent. Uh, I, I would prefer that we stop looking at it as public school funding and we start looking at it, at it as school funding. Uh, this is, like, like Luther said, this isn't something that's going to go away. There was opportunity to end the Milwaukee program years ago when the Democrats were in control, and the reason it didn't end was because Milwaukee Democrat legislators saw the value in the program and refused to allow it to end. Uh, and there's no reason that other people in the state shouldn't have the benefit of this program just like Milwaukee does. Uh, as for the success of the program, you know, we're not talking huge differences between the scores on here, but the scores have consistently shown higher uh, results in choice schools and charter as well uh, in both of the programs. And so graduation rates are here, and so I, I th think it's indisputable that the program has been successful and it continues to grow because people are answering with their feet. They're deciding which school they want to go to, which is ultimately what we want to have is them be satisfied with their choice. You shake your head no. Five seconds on why? Yeah, I mean, I would include myself in the 54% of people not satisfied with my public school. But the difference is, is I can go to my publicly elected school board member, advocate for changes, and work to make those differences for not just my kids, but for all kids. Choice parents, or so-called choice parents, voucher parents, don't have that. There's no school board to advocate to. There's no public reporting of what's happening in there, and they can decide their own graduation standards. So sure, their graduation rates are going to be sky high, because they can say, great, you showed up enough, here's a certificate. That doesn't mean that they're doing any better. And the facts show that, that they're, they're, they're just, just the same, uh, and they're taking a lot of money away. So I think it'd be great to have this public debate. It'd be great to have it in this chamber one day and debate the merits of this. But uh, unfortunately, that has, that has never happened in the 30-year history. It's been around. The thing you've got to remember, though, is you don't have to send your child to a choice school. So if you're unhappy, you say, I can't go to them and talk about it. You don't have to send them there. You have to send your child to a public school if you're not going someplace and else. And who takes those kids that leave the voucher school. They come back to the public school and there is absolutely nothing to be done except educate that child. At whatever juncture they're at in that school year, at whatever cost, if a private voucher school chooses to um, expel a student for whatever reason, they go back to the public school at the public dollar. Final comment on the subject, Representative, before uh, we move on? I guess I would just reiterate the fact that uh, this program has been successful and there was a comment earlier, I think it was Senator Larson, I'm not sure what he meant by it, but it, maybe I'm misinterpreting it that the choice schools choose their students. No, they do not. Uh, the vouchers, that's a, that's a random selection that goes on, uh, and they don't have any decision over which students go into the school. Uh, so that, that is not an accurate statement. Um, I hope that's not what he meant by that. And you know I'm going to disagree with you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Occasionally when that happens. <laughs> Time is getting away. I have two more, two more questions. Generally, have charter schools in Wisconsin been successful? So uh, that's my next to last question. Anybody? Charter schools? Charter schools. Some have, some haven't, just yeah. like public schools. I mean, there, you know, there's charter schools that have been very successful and there's charter schools that haven't and a lot of times they go away. The biggest problem that I think we have with charter schools is there's ones that don't work, but the uh, authorizing agency does not really pull the plug on those fast mm -hmm. enough. But are charter schools working? I, I think in some instances they work great, some instances they don't. The whole thing about charter schools was designed so that it could be an experiment and saying, okay, let's look at this school, let's see how we can educate kids different, and then take that and send that back to the public schools, and, you know, because charter schools are public, but the regular brick and mortar. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened. I think a lot of times uh, charter schools have become alternative schools. Okay. Anybody else in charter schools? I, I, would, I would say that I, I just wish that for those that were in existence that failed, and a majority of the charter schools that came into existence have failed, 
there's not a penalty, right? So they can end up taking this money, they can take their model, and they can go down to Florida or go someplace else and open up a school and try the exact same thing. So the, this is them experimenting on our kids. And I think that there should have been more safeguards put in place uh, to prevent that if they were going to go down this. Richard. If the idea of saying, yes, we're going to have a charter, we're going to try some new things, and we're going to transition those, those over, uh, yeah, that could make sense. But, but a lot of the programs that are operating are operating under uh, the guide of um, hedge funds, of people looking to try and figure out how to siphon money out. Uh, look at the case just, just came out of San Diego. Uh, where there was people authorizing charters and they, the operators made off with tens of millions of dollars and kids are left holding the bags. We had in, in cases like that here. Um, so yes, some of them can make sense, others don't. I, I just think there wasn't enough disincentives put in place early on uh, to prevent the bad actors from entering well, the first Well, I, I have to disagree a little bit because most of the charter schools in this state are authorized by school boards. They have charter schools in no. their district. There's a few... Uh, and then there's some that are, you know, by the, the techno or the university system and things like that. We don't have many charter schools that are run by companies. That's a small, small minority. Most of them are public schools run by uh, another board that is authorized by the local school board. And again, without having a local school board, an elected body to go to and make changes, advocate for changes, then what's the solution? Final word yeah. on charter? Strength of any school out there is going to be dependent on the teachers that they have, the leadership that the school has, and the dedication of the parents. And sometimes it's not going to be strong and the school's going to fail and not Can do as well. But uh, most of them, I think, have done well. Okay, it just occurs to me, I'm going to squeeze in one more next to last question. <laughs> Are you hearing from your constituents that they're worried about school safety in the wake of some of these tragedies? Just real quickly. Um, it, I mean, it is. There was a, one of my school districts did apply for one of the grants last session because they are they're trying to figure this out. They're trying to figure out, okay, what happens if there's a shooter? I mean, it enters a whole other conversation. I think yeah. we're looking at it from the wrong angle. Right. We should be talking about guns. We should be talking about uh, making sure that they're not getting in the hands of people who are going to use them against kids and not the other side of it of saying, let's prepare like we're in a war zone and have kids run through these drills. School safety come up in terms of when you interact with your... I, I g get an occasional email that obviously upticks when you have one of these shootings around the country, uh, but it hasn't been anything unusual here in recent weeks. I hear, from, I hear from my constituents frequently that they're just afraid to send their kids to school anywhere in America anymore. It isn't my district, my school. It's every place is always shocked and surprised when it happens there because, you know, we're here and it's, it's, it's our little safe community. Nobody feels that blanket of safetyness around them any longer. Any PS, Senator? Yeah, I, it's sad that kids have to worry and parents have to worry about their kids being safe in school. We didn't worry about that when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. the, the research that's really interesting, though, is the stuff that really helps uh, schools be safer isn't metal detectors right. and all this. It's mental health uh, of the students and watching what's going on. That really, they say, that is the thing that really reduces uh, the the terrible things that are happening is making sure that we see what's going on with those kids that are in that building and if there's an issue you can sort of tell it do something about it that that seems to be the thing that really stands out okay and this is my final question I promise <laughs> what are the major k-12 policy questions facing the state over the next 10 years Senator Larson? Uh, frankly, I think we need to rethink the way that we do our schools beginning to end. I think we need to be thinking less of a K-12 model and more of a uh, K-99 model, which is we have this idea that we kids start in kindergarten, they go to 12th grade, some of them go on to college, and that's it, and you're done learning for life. Uh, and I think most people, if, you, if you're in a room full of adults and, and that aren't legislators, and you ask, Are, do you think you're going to be in this job in five years, uh, the job that you're in, most of them won't raise their hand. And I think a lot of people understand with the evolving economy, we need to think about how we make sure that the, the pledge of public education being funded uh, continues on throughout life. And then also at the early end of it, of making sure we're getting kids in the door earlier, getting quality childcare, quality early childhood education, teaching empathy, teaching them how to, uh, how to be uh, with other, other people and uh, be in a, a place with other students. I think that's key, and I think uh, the other thing is, is switching it so that we don't have 
uh, a teacher in the front of the room, but you have teach students working across uh, from each other. We have this idea that, that we're teaching kids uh, and they're going to learn, they're going to they're gonna somehow use that for, for work, but no work uh, that I know of has eight separate bosses giving you eight separate assignments throughout the day, and they all know the answers. It's usually you go there, you work on a problem together, you try and figure out what the best solution is. Uh, so I think the more that we uh, put apprenticeships into high schools and the more that we're uh, adjusting our models to the modern economy, I think that's, that's the challenge of the next 10 years of letting go of those things that we're used to, of what school was like when we were kids, and saying what's actually going to prepare us for, uh, for the modern age. Thank you. Senator? I think there's a, a number of issues, and in, in, uh, Chris talked about schools changing, but I think the big issue is uh, we're not going to have the teacher talent that we need because our population is not where it needs to be. It's not growing. But also, our student population is going to be going down in certain areas, and we have an infrastructure that is designed for so many kids, and that's going to be an issue dealing with that. We have mental health issues. We have poverty issues that we've never had before. We have bilingual, bicultural issues that we have to have to deal with. Um, and as I said before, people want individualized education for their kids. And it used to be, you know, years ago, you didn't have to educate everybody. In fact, I meeting I was at the other day, years they said, you know, we got to educate a few good ones, and the rest, you know, it used to be, you know. If, if you have a strong back, you could get by with a weak mind. Well, you can't do that anymore, and so we have to educate every student, and that is expensive, and it's challenging, and the challenges are changing all the time. We can't do what we used to do, and so I, I think the state needs to look at, and the country needs to look at, how do we change the system? Because the system worked, but the folks coming in the door have different needs than they did years ago. Thank you. Representative. I, I agree with everything that has been said, so I won't be redundant and, and say it again. But I think we have to think about what uh, changes are coming in technology. Um, when I was in school, there were no cell phones. There were, no hard, there were hardly any calculators, right, Luther? There wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no pocket so, calculators, that's for sure. Right. So what's coming, we can't see. We need to be prepared for. I don't think that we really need to necessarily continue this model of nine months on, three months off. I'm not sure it serves our students well. Mm -hmm. So there's another area that we can look to do some changing. Uh, schools are already free to do that, but they don't. Um, and I think the expansion of voucher schools is a problem that we need to address in terms of policy for Wisconsin. Thank you. Final word, Representative. Well, it's been hinted at a couple times here. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said, but uh, one I would say is top of the list is declining enrollment, um, where we are going to have to figure out how to adequately fund uh, students when we have fewer of them and we aren't going to be able to continue to provide at the same level that we can because we just have fewer people doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a different one than others said, I, I, I think, is that when you look at how students, how, how we evaluate schools now, we're looking at test scores and, you know, that's quantitative data. The, the way teaching is going, uh, the way employers are looking at students now is they aren't necessarily looking at you know, are you really good at math and science and English? They want you to be able to work with people. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're in school, that's not data that you can really quantify. Uh, and so what happens with the test scores as a result of that? Um, because we aren't going to be teaching our students in the same way that we used to. Fascinating. We need we didn't even get into test scores. That's whole other subject. Can add another last, another last question. <laughs> yeah. so civil dialogue. Back to school. I, I want to thank Representative Jeremy Thiesfeld, Representative Sandy Pope, Senator Luther Olson, Senator Chris Larson. No more important subject. And school starts soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel to gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. 
Wisconsin Eye would not exist without generous donors like you. Please visit wisai.org to make a donation today.